So once again, I'm Edgar Palacios, founder of the Latinx Education Collaborative. Um, we work on increasing the representation of Latinx education professionals in K-12. Um, and part of the reason that we do Ask an Educator is to elevate the voices of, of Latino educators out in the field doing the, the great work that they're doing. And so it is my pleasure today um, to have our special guest, Ali Melendez, with us today. Hey, Ali, how are you doing? Hello, Edgar. I'm great. How are you doing? Doing fantastic. Um, sure. My first question for you, um, actually, you know what, let me just start by asking you a little bit about yourself, because I was going to go straight into the business of, of education. Uh, but tell us, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. So um, during the COVID time, I have been a fourth grade teacher here in Los Angeles, um, California, and I've been loving getting to educate on the Zoom platform. Although I do, I really do miss having the in-classroom experience. Um, but yeah, so I've been teaching fourth grade and then I'm also a current graduate student, um, finished my master's degree, but I'm going to be starting my doctorate in the fall. So very excited about that. That's fantastic. What are you going to be studying for your doctorate? Uh, so it'll be a doctorate in education and it'll all be focused on health and sexuality studies for K through 12. That is an interesting topic, particularly for K to 12. Uh, so I'm going to ask you more about that. Um, can you walk us a little bit through your journey and, and what motivated you to start teaching? Sure. So it's actually really funny. I went to the University of Kansas for my undergrad and I majored in journalism and Spanish. So I had no idea I wanted to be a teacher until I actually volunteered in a classroom one day. And to this day, I haven't left a classroom. So... I, it was just all through volunteerism and just finding uh, Did you volunteer through a specific organization or was it um, you just went into a classroom and, and helped support it? I literally just went into a classroom. Um, one of my old babysitters is a teacher for the Los Angeles Unified School District and I just went into her classroom one day. <laughs> Very unfortunate. So, so how how long ago was that that you entered into the volunteer role and then became a teacher? What was that? What was that process like? So I volunteered in, oh my goodness, it was September of 2018. And I ended up getting a contract to teach in January of 2019. So it was a pretty quick turnaround. <laughs> how did, so are you still dealing with certification? Um, are you still working on that? Or how did, how did that like work? That's a great question. I actually, I finished my certification last week. So it took, yes. <laughs> I celebrate that. Yes, fantastic. Thank Congratulations. Thank you. Yes, it's a it's a very lengthy process. Um, way harder than getting a master's degree, let me tell you. Um, getting credentialed in California. So it took eight standardized tests and a ton of sending in lesson plans and sending in videos of how I teach. Um, but it was a pretty quick process. I mean, it was a year and a half was what it took me. No, um, it's it's insane. And there's a lot of data out there that demonstrate that the certification, um, while it's important to certify teachers, it also doesn't correlate to like teacher effectiveness in the long term. And so exactly. I'm, I'm interested in, you know, like for me specifically in terms of elevating and increasing the number of Latino educators, um, how do we do some work on, you know, uh, maybe shifting certification requirements, making it a little bit less taxing? Um, so folks can get into into the field and, and do the work that they want to do. Absolutely. And actually, it's amazing. So in California here, uh, Governor Newsom actually just lifted the requirement for the last part of the teaching credential. So he's really trying to make it easier for teachers to be credentialed, especially with COVID restrictions. Um, but I think the biggest barrier um, for Latino, Latina uh, educators is the price. I mean, it is unbelievably expensive to become a credentialed teacher in California. Um, so what's, what's the average cost of that, if you don't mind sharing? Sure, it's between thirty and sixty thousand yeah. dollars. To become credentialed <laughs> in California, the state of California. Yes, and I chose the cheapest online course that I could find. Yeah, and it was over thirty thousand dollars. That is insane. Now, did you get any financial support or anything like that? Are there are those kind of supports available to folks interested in, in the pipeline or no? Sure. So I got a little bit of financial support, but a lot of different school districts will help you pay 
but then they require you to actually work for them for a pretty long amount of time after you get that certification. So um, because of that, I did um, a lot of just kind of private funding so that I didn't have to commit myself to a certain district for any amount of time. Which is which is nice to have that flexibility a little bit and, and totally understand on, on that commitment because if a school invests that kind of money, you know, they also want to make sure that they, they reap some of the rewards of that investment. But such an interesting predicament for folks who want to actually get into the teaching field um, are qualified, have the energy, the disposition to do it. Um, and then there might be that additional challenge of the of obviously financial is, is a huge challenge and, and barrier to the system. And that that assumes that you get certified on your first go around, too. Exactly. And it took me. So one of the parts is the RECA, which is the Reading Instructional Competency Assessment. It took me five times to pass. And each time is $250 that I had to spend to take it. That's that's kind of that's sort of insane. And let me so some people will push back and I've had these conversations with around certification, right? Like, well, maybe they didn't prepare well enough. Maybe maybe the, the, the candidate, you know, didn't do what we're supposed to be doing. And so therefore they had to take the exams multiple times. Um, I don't feel like you are representative of that candidate. So can you talk a little bit about why you think that it took you five times to, to reach that or to, to gain the certification or the, the RECA? Sure. So I think it was hard. Well, so I was teaching first grade at the beginning of the school year, and I was actually teaching reading and literacy uh, to that group. And I think it was just really hard for me to kind of give them the exact answer that they wanted to hear, because quite frankly, there are so many ways to teach children how to read. And it's just at this point, it was just really me figuring out what does the RECA test want me to say and not how does how do I teach it in my classroom, but how do they want me to teach it was kind of what I had to figure out. There's a lot there, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and pivot um, because ultimately the, the result was that you do be, you, you became a certified teacher and now you're teaching fourth mm -hmm. grade. Um, and you're yeah. teaching in probably one of the most interesting times uh, at least of this year. And so um, part of the reason I reached out to you um, is because I absolutely loved um, what you were doing with the students, the way that you were engaging them, um, particularly with um, Snapchat and I would, I assume TikTok, Instagram, and all the other social media uh, platforms out there that were available. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, take me all the way back to maybe the day before you found out about like the school's plans for COVID. What was that for you? Sure, so it was actually crazy. So my fourth graders were on a away trip and we got the, the call that we're gonna be closing school for at least two weeks, which in retrospect, it's like two weeks, we were crazy. I think we were gonna go back up to the two week period. Um, but so in that period, it was like, I had four days to kind of prep and get the materials ready to go and send them home with the students. And in that time, I thought, okay, I'm gonna be teaching in a whole new different way. And I really want my kids to want to come to class every day and want to be on a computer screen for the majority of the day. Um, and so that's when I came up with the idea of having a different costume every single day. Um, and the first week, I just reached out to our performing arts department and said, hey, can I borrow a couple things? And then after that, I had friends coming out of the woodworks and saying, oh, I've got a bin of Halloween costumes or whatever it may be. Um, so yeah, it was really fun to get to not only lesson plan every day, but also plan what my costume was going to be and find a way to curricularly um, kind of uh, integrate what my costume was with what I was teaching for the day. I, I love that so much. And I love the energy and thought behind it and the fact that the community stepped up. Just real quickly, I want to acknowledge Delia, thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate you being here. Um, and, and, and really, so why costumes? What, what made you think that costumes would be a way that you would continue to engage students and that that would affect their attention and at least maintain their attention during this time? Yeah, that's a great question. So I've always, Halloween is just my favorite holiday in general, but also I've always found that when you look or do something that's really kind of out of the ordinary for the kids, they will respond in a positive way because they do see that you're trying to interact with them in a way that they will appreciate and understand. Um, and then also, the, I love the idea of costumes because it was something that I could do every day, despite 
everything going on, there's very little uncertainty right now. We don't know if we're going to be back in the classroom next year. I mean, there's a lot going on. But I did know every single day the kids could expect me to be in something ridiculous and outlandish. <laughs> so it was really, for me, it was kind of giving the kids some form of stability that they need to be successful, not only in the classroom, but just throughout our 2020 right now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. What um, what was your favorite costume and what was the worst costume? Oh, that's such a good question. The My favorite costume was probably, I dressed up as Violet Beauregard from, um, from Willy Wonka and I got to be a giant inflatable blueberry and the kids loved it. And I rolled around on TikTok for them and they just died. <laughs> it was so great. Um, and then I think, ooh, what was the worst costume? I think the Shrek one that I ordered, because I did, I ordered a Shrek costume online and it came, I, I paid like $4 for it and I got $4 worth of the Shrek costume. It was terrifying. I'll have to send you a picture later. But that thing is what nightmares are made of. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. I mean, it, 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 first of all, so how many costumes did you end up wearing all throughout the, throughout the end of, remainder of the year? It was 49. I wore 49 different costumes. And did you ever miss a day? Never once. Wow. So do you think that you'll continue to do that kind of work? Um, do you think that you'll incorporate that kind of um, activity long term or? I'm hoping to. I really am because um, it was really fun. And I think what was really important, too, was the attendance rate of my kids. I, I didn't have a single kid miss a class. And I think that was because they were excited to see what crazy outfit I would be wearing that day. Yeah. Um, but no, I think it definitely created a really good sense of engagement with me and my students. What did your days look like um, in terms of, of just the instruction in general? Like what was what was that experience like for you? Sure. So we uh, the way that my school organized it was there was a session in the morning, um, kind of a later morning and then an afternoon session. So in all, I was probably teaching. Oh, I've got a, so they were both. So all three of them were three and a half hours. Oh my God, my math is so bad. I've got summer teacher brain. So it was, <laughs> let's see, that's, oh my God, that's four and a half hours of instruction every day. Pretty sure, not gun wood. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a long time. And, and then you're also doing it in a way that you may have not been trained in. And so like utilizing Zoom or whatever the, the platform was that you utilized, I think it's, it's such an interesting kind of navigation. Um, what were, what were the experience of the other teachers? What did the other teachers say? I'm sure you were like sharing the fact that you were in costumes. Like what, what kind of, what was their feedback? Yeah. So they, they thought it was a really fun, creative way. And I thought it was really interesting too, because so many teachers had their own spin as well. Um, like other teachers that I worked with would do like a pajama day one day or one week that the kids would dress up as the teacher and the teachers would dress up as the kids or whatever it would be, but kind of having those fun, engaging um, activities. And then also something that I started with my fourth graders was uh, every day we did a scavenger hunt. And it wasn't going to look for one specific item, but it was like, oh, go and find something that is um, white or go and find a coin that's from earlier than the 2000s or whatever it may be. And the kids would get really interested um, in participating in that every single day. So a lot of teachers in different grades implemented some form of scavenger hunt um, as well within their morning meetings, which is really fun. Uh, I just experienced, I got to say, I'm glad that you brought up the scavenger hunt. I just experienced a scavenger hunt uh, that Laura went on uh, just a few hours ago, and I was confused. I don't understand why she was doing that, but you know, it seemed like a lot of fun. Um, and so I, I just appreciate that kind of interaction and interactivity. Um, I'm going to pivot a, a, again because I, I do have some questions around um, representation in general. So you, we met while you were in the area here in Kansas City, um, and now you're in LA. What does re teacher representation look like, uh, particularly in your district? Um, are there are there any issues with teacher representation at all? Like. Are, is it is it I, I I I've been I assume it's more diverse, um, but I'd love to hear like what your your opinion and in, in, in your experience has been thus far. Sure. I actually I was expecting it to be better um, than Kansas City in terms of representation. And quite frankly, it it has a long way to go. Um, there are I am one of three Latina teachers in a school of 53 teachers. 
And there is one black classroom teacher in my school as well. Um, and so, I mean, those numbers are not great. Um, there are a few, and I believe there's about four or five Asian teachers, but just in terms of the people of color who are teaching, um, I, I'm, I was really disappointed to see the lack of diversity, um, not only with um, race, but also in religion, in age. There's, there's just a lot of work to be done with teachers, not only in my district, but really across California as well. You know, that, that to me is interesting, right? Because I think that um, I have a narrative in, in particular around the coast that um, representation is better and maybe not such an issue. But the reality is like th these are issues that are systemic and persist all across the country, not just in Kansas City. Um, and so I, I appreciate you shining light on that. Um, what What is your experience as a as a new teacher, um, as a Latina teacher? Like, how does that how does that inform your work? Um, does it inform your work? Um, and, you know, what, what, what does that look like for you? Sure. That's a great question. I think one of the ways that I look at it, um, especially I'm the youngest teacher in my school um, by about three years since I am, I, I'm a new 24 year old. Um, so I am quite young, but I think at first I didn't try to see race when I kind of entered the classroom and just wanted to see myself as a female educator. Um, but I think it was really important to me to look at the books and look at the curriculum that I am um, required to teach and really kind of hold a magnifying glass up to it and say, hmm, there's not a lot of Latina history. There's not a lot of black history that I'm teaching. I have zero LGBTQ history that I get to teach. And really asking the question of why is that not included in my curriculum? And then also saying, how can I, as the teacher, be a part of changing this curriculum that of course we are required to teach, but I think that we as teachers need to take it upon ourselves to make the changes um, in teaching, like the content of what we teach. Um, so I'll ask you about that then, like what kind of changes or what kind of things have you implemented to help increase the diversity of just the curriculum or the content that you're sharing with students? Sure, I think the biggest thing is really, um, it has to do with social studies or what we call humanities. And that is shedding the light on um, big events or experiences or people who we might not otherwise be taught about. Um, and that includes the literature. We read um, Esperanza Rising by Pam Munoz Ryan. Um, she's a local California author and she writes about the experience of what it means to immigrate from Mexico to California. And giving my students, who most of whom did not immigrate to uh, California, just the ideas of what it means to um, be a Mexican-American um, in California it was really important to me to include that um, kind of literature in the classroom. And then also during COVID teaching um, and during the Black Lives Matter protests, when they were really at their height here in Los Angeles, we spoke a lot about um, the movement, where Black Lives Matter really stemmed from. Um, and then we also talked about amazing Black leaders kind of from the 60s onward we talked about the Black Panther movement. And then also, since I did end in June, in California, we end our school year a little bit later, um, we talked about pride and how a transgender Black woman started the pride, started pride with the Stonewall riots. So really getting the chance to incorporate that into my curriculum was really a beautiful thing. And I forever will be thankful for Zoom education, giving me the platform to <laughs> to discuss these amazing parts of our history. Um, I think one thing it's it, it's so it's a fourth grader. Th these are these are topics that you're dealing with in, in fourth grade. Yeah. Um, what was the response of students? Um, what was you know what were the conversations like? I'm interested in that. Yeah. So actually, on our very last day, we asked the kids kind of what their highlight was, and one of the, our black students said that he could not be more thankful to have black history included. And he said that he was learning what it meant to be black and that it was helpful. And I just started bawling. I was just like, oh my God, I was overwhelmed um, by that um, comment made by one of my students. And I think it is really important to have that representation of every single one of our students. And you're right, even if we don't have a ton of black students, a ton of Hispanic students, that history needs to be taught. Um, 
And so it was, that was really the most impactful experience for me. I appreciate you sharing that. You mentioned you ended in June. We're still <laughs> in June. How long have you not been in school? Only a week. I've, Only yeah. a week. Yes. <laughs> when do you go back? We go back in August. Second. Okay. Woo. So you get a, a relatively short period of time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what I guess, what are your concerns coming into the new year? Um, you know, what what's the communication that your district has been having with you? Like what what has been answered? What hasn't been answered? That's a great question. Um, a lot of us, we really don't know what's going to happen. Um, but my current school, so they're basically saying we're going back 100 percent. Um, so we're just trying to figure out, first of all, asking children to socially distance is ludicrous in my humble opinion, as someone who has been in a classroom before. Um, so just trying to figure out exactly how it's going to work. Um, and then also something that just got released this morning is saying that in California, they're actually not going to require attendance in the upcoming school year, um, which is one of the biggest ways that we get funding. So They're not going to require attendance? No, because they think that so many kids are going to be at home. Um, I think a lot of the parents are going to be afraid to send their children back. But then yeah. there's also the issue of parents who work. And yeah, of course. Yeah. So it's, we don't really know. There's a lot of things that are kind of up in the air right now. Um, I think that's the first time I've heard that uh, attendance wouldn't be required. And so that also, yeah. so if I think of it from a, from a different perspective, like why go to school? Um, if attendance can be sometimes, you know, um, a key um, motivator to go to school. Um, I think about all the students that may continue to be disenfranchised because of a policy like that. But I also understand, I mean, it's, 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 it's an incredibly difficult situation and I don't know how many right answers there are to it. Um, but that's wild. Do you, have you kind of, um, so how are they talking about funding schools in California without the attendance policy? That's a great question. So as a teacher, we have not been a part of that conversation. Um, but I mean, obviously we're very worried. A lot of the funding does come from how many students are in the building. And that was a huge problem during um, last calendar year. We had all of the, um, the strikes and the protests here for the Los Angeles Unified School District. And a huge part of it was parents were having to send their students to school because they had nowhere else to go. Um, and because of that, they would take attendance and every single day they would have to kind of like itemize the children and say, oh, well, we can give them this amount of money because this amount of students showed up. And so it is, it's just a huge problem here in Los Angeles um, with attendance. <laughs> yeah, and you know, something you said really, really struck me, which is like the itemizing of students and, you know, yeah. and the, yeah. the, the capitalistic kind of uh, connotations of all that. Um, yeah, no, it's business. The LAUSD, as someone who's worked for it, I, I never once thought I was in a school. I thought I am an employee. I never thought I'm a teacher. I thought I am an employee. And I think mm. that was just so horrible. And you're right. The kids are our clients and the parents are our clients. And it is, yeah. it's one for money and not for our kids. I'm going to, I'm going to sit on that because I think that that's, that's that's kind of you know it's a lot to process uh, now. Not that we don't talk about these issues you know consistently and continuously, but I think it's always it's always um, it's hard to hear because of the reality like that 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 can feel that way. And you know as I, I also wonder what that does in terms of retention of teachers. Um, and you know if you're there to to be in the classroom and to support students and to really build those relationships, but then it feels like it's more of a business transaction. Like what does that do to your psyche as a teacher? Um, and you know, how do you navigate through that? Yeah. Oh, that's such a good question. I mean, it's just, I think retention rates are crazy um, with teaching. I saw a study a few months ago and it said that it was something like 80% of teachers leave the classroom after three years. And I'm going into my third year. So I'm like, oh, sweet Jesus. <laughs> I'm like, is this going to be the time? Um, but I think the greatest thing about teaching is that a lot of people like me who kind of stumbled into teaching, this is not something that we do for the money. This is something that we do because we genuinely love it. And quite frankly, 
if I won the lottery, I would still come into the classroom because it's what I love to do. So I think that's really important um, for teachers is finding it not like, first of all, please like children. I know a lot of teachers who don't like children. On our teachers. <laughs> <laughs> Some good advice. Uh, you, you probably want to like children if that's the case. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Um, but yeah, I think it's definitely, it's a crazy time to be a teacher and I'm praying that the retention rates are good, especially during COVID. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I guess some of my questions for you right now are, are related to the fact, so you are entering your third year. Um, statistics yeah. are showing um, that more than likely you're not going to, you know, um, stick around. Um, if, if you were just a statistic, like you wouldn't stick around after the next year. And yeah. so what are, what are kind of some of the supports that you'd like to see that you'd like to have mm -hmm. that would help you stick around for that fourth year, fifth year. And then maybe uh, after five years, you're pretty much committed. I think that that's what the stats show. And so what, what kind of supports do you actually need and are looking for in order for that to happen? That's a great question. I think, that really just the support from not only our administration, but also the parents and really having good relationships with everyone with whom that we work is really important. Um, and I think a huge part of the reason that I'm continuing my own education is so that I'm able to best serve my students um, and really grow as an educator myself. Um, because quite a few teachers, not only in California, but across the United States, they have very limited resources in terms of professional development. And that is extremely essential in making sure that our students have updated curriculum and that we are practicing best practices in our classrooms every day. Um, so I think it's really, really important to make sure that um, all of us educators are given the right resources in terms of professional development. Um, and then also just getting the government behind us with funding and not defunding education any further than they have already. So much there. Um, when, when you talk about professional development, like what are what do you think some of the things that are lacking in the current offerings outside of the fact that you have very limited opportunities to attend professional development? Um, what are some of the areas specifically that you think are missing? Oh my gosh, so much. I think, I really do think that the biggest part of professional development for me has been updating the current curriculum because a lot of curriculum that schools have used, um, I've worked in three different schools in my three years. And I think the biggest thing is that we have teachers who have been in the classroom for 20 plus years and they have been teaching the same thing every single year. And I think it's really important for the professional development to say, okay, this is what we've been teaching. How can we update it to make sure that it is up to date and that our kids are getting exactly what they need to be taught. And again, that comes a lot in humanities um, because I think mathematics, they're doing a great job at updating that. Um, but the rest, I th also think science, a lot of schools, especially in Kansas, I don't know if you're aware of this, but in Kansas, you're given the choice as a classroom teacher if you wanna teach creation or if you wanna teach um, like actual science. There, that is a choice that you have as a teacher. And, and, and you know what? I, I think it'd be interesting. I'd love to see the data on like how that choice actually plays out um, and see, you know, what percentage of students in the state of Kansas actually see um, science curriculum and, and what percentage of students actually see creation um, as a curriculum. That is, yeah. that's fascinating. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to do some investigative homework on that um, yeah, and, and check sure. that out. Um, you know, the other thing that I I constantly question and I've made an assumption on is like the importance of community um, as well in terms of the retention of particularly Latin teachers. Um, do you think that that's important? Do you not think it's important? I love your love to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. Absolutely, I think community is important to build in every aspect. Um, I think a huge part of my teaching philosophy is relationships come first and making sure that I have those relationships with not only my students, but their parents um, is really important to me um, because I really do think that education in the classroom should not stop when they leave school. I think that it needs to be continued at home 
and wherever else our students may be going um, throughout their lives. So I think it's really important to create those relationships. Um, and then also, kind of like you said, just having that representation of having more Latinx teachers, having more Black teachers, having more teachers with different uh, viewpoints, different religions, all of these um, pieces of diversity that are so important to understand. It's so important to give our students that in the form of a teacher. Um, because, I mean, at the end of the day, I could read from any book about Black history, but I myself am not a Black educator. And I think it's just so much more powerful when our kids are able to have a Black educator teaching them about Black history. Um, so I think, again, that representation is the yeah. most um, so You are going into your third year, so I'm excited yeah. about that. Um, what do you think has improved, like how has your teaching practice improved um, from that first year of teaching? Oh my gosh. I think the biggest thing for first year teachers is classroom management and learning how to manage a classroom full of children. I mean, it's, it's like herding cats. I mean, it's just crazy. And I tell my parents all the time, I'm like, you're not getting grandkids. Like I'm so overwhelmed with children every day. <laughs> um, yeah, I have like 30 children a year. So, I mean, that's like a Duggar family plus some. So I think it's fine. I think I'm fine if I'm childless. <laughs> But um, I think that definitely managing the classroom and understanding kind of how to earn students' respect and get them to really um, kind of follow the rules that you put into place was really the biggest hurdle that I had to jump as a first-year teacher. Um, and then also I think just kind of my second year was really focused on me kind of hoping that I was doing the right thing. And really, um, I think the biggest thing for me was just gaining confidence as a teacher. Because when you're new at anything, you kind of have that imposter syndrome of, am I doing the right thing? Am, am I supposed to be in this role? Um, but I think going into my third year, I feel really strong and confident in my abilities to teach. And I hope that teachers who are still starting are able to push through and yeah. find that. Um, what kind of supports have you had along the way that have actually built your confidence? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I've had a lot of really wonderful mentor teachers, um, some of whom are well into their 60s and have been teaching for their whole lives, longer than I've been on this earth, um, who have been really essential in teaching me um, just a lot about what it means to be an educator um, and how to really best um be good to myself so I can be good to our students. And then also I think it's really important to have that community of former or former of fellow educators um, who are around my age. Um, I got the amazing chance to co-teach with women who are very close to my age and using them as a soundboard every day was really important. Um, but then also I was given the chance to go to quite a few professional development trainings. I went to six last year. So that was quite a few. Um, and I think a huge part of the reason that I was chosen to go on professional developments is because I don't have children at home. I'm not married. Um, and so I have that time to go and travel and go to these professional development trainings um, and learn about how I can be a better teacher. You know, that's an, that's an interesting point. And I think about um, teachers that do have kids and that do, do have families, um, and, and particularly now, with, 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 even with COVID, right? So they're maybe not only attending to their to their students, but they're also attending to their their own children. And you know the the, the complexities of all that. Um, that's a really I appreciate you bringing that out and raising that point because I think that that it's it, it's something worth noting. Um, so you have I hate to say this, but you have less than like what two months <laughs> to go back yeah. to school. Um, I do. <laughs> what are you excited about? Oh my gosh, I'm really excited about um, kind of just continuing my research because the cool thing about my doctorate is that it's active research, which means that I'm not doing like a kind of a traditional doctorate where I write a massive essay. But what I'm doing is I am taking all of the pieces of curriculum that I'm able to build and, and basically all I have to do is write and photograph and videotape how well my curriculum that I'm developing is actually working in the classroom. So 
we'll cross our fingers that we're able to go back in the in the fall. Um, but worst case scenario, I will be teaching on Zoom. Um, and quite frankly, I've gotten used to it. Uh, this is the new normal, and I'm learning. I get better at Zoom every day. My eyes get worse, but it's fine. There's a trade off. <laughs> um, but no, I think I'm just really excited to see um, how my the curriculum that I'm developing is going to be working in a Zoom kind of environment because a lot of what I do teach is very project heavy, and I really I put the kids in charge of their own learning. Um, is a huge part of my teaching philosophy. And it's, I mean, it's hard to do projects over Zoom. <laughs> um, so yeah, we'll see how that goes. Yeah, you know, at least initially, in a, but I think to your point, like the more you get, in, um, the more you understand how to utilize it to its, to its cap capacity, um, I, you can figure some of those things out. Um, I do know that there are a lot of people who, you know, really believe that real instruction can't happen over Zoom. And so I'm interested to see like what that looks like and you know what the data like plays out over the long term of this. Um, and of course, you know, it's an ex experiment, um, unfortunately, on a whole generation of kids um, that are currently actively, you know, developing and, and you know, one day will be our, 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 our own leaders. And so it'll be interesting to see how this, this shift um, will impact uh, our, our community long, long term. Um, I'm excited about you going to your, getting your EDD. Um, I think representation, particularly um, from from Latinas uh, who hold a doctorate degree of any kind, um, is relatively small. I think it's around like two to four yep. percent. Um, and so you're going to be a pioneer and you're going to be trailblazing um, when 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 you achieve that goal. Um, I actually you are you're a trailblazing and a pioneer right now. But you know even Thank even you. more so when 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 you achieve that goal. Um, I my question to you is what do you you're 24. Yep. Um, that's relatively young in any career. Um, you're about to get a doctorate um, within the next couple of years. What What's like your vision long term um, as an educator? What do you hope to be doing in the, the next five years, in the next 10 years? Oh, my gosh. I think if I could do anything, I would become like the go to uh, health and sexuality educator for every district here in California. Um, and kind of like being the Dr. Ruth, or if you've seen, um, there's a show called Sex Education on Netflix. There's Dr. Jean Milburn. I would love to be her when I grow up. Um, and just providing the health education that our students deserve. And that is one of the biggest disparities in kind of just across the United States is health education. Um, I mean, in Kansas, I had friends who were never given health. And that to me was like mind blowing. And here in yeah. California, even even in California, I was not given the greatest health experience um, in terms of health and sex education. And I think that our lives would be greatly improved. Mm -hmm. Understanding what are healthy relationships? How can I avoid getting an STI? All of these things. I mean, those are important topics. And I think a lot of teachers who are older than I am are extremely uncomfortable talking about those topics. Um, and I think also they weren't given that education. If I wasn't given it, they sure as heck were not given it either. Um, yeah. Can you, can you name some of those disparities for us, um, for those that may not be familiar with like the health disparities that you're addressing? Um, sure. Absolutely. So when I was um, going to school at the University of Kansas, I had a lot of friends who were given abstinence-only education. And so they were literally put in a room, told, never have sex, you will die, like, <laughs> um, like wait until marriage, all of that. And they were given purity rings. And that was the extent of their sex education. Um, whereas here in California, I was given um, quite a bit of what does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to be a man? Um, I went over gender roles explicitly when I was in middle and high school. Um, and then we were also given pretty extensive um, drug education, so substance and drug. And then also we were given um, sex education. So how to be healthy in not only your physical body, but then we also discussed a lot about mental health. And so, again, looking at my experience in high school and then having my friends who were literally just told, don't have sex. Here's a ring. 
I think that that's a huge problem and that, thank God, in the past few years, we have national health standards that have been um, spread across the entire United States. And so my goal with my own health and sexuality education uh, curriculum is going to be to address those national health standards, um, not only here in California, but hopefully, hopefully I'll be in Kansas City soon being able to teach um, health and sexuality to kids who wouldn't necessarily get it otherwise. You know, you mentioned um, how those topics can be uncomfortable um, and the discomfort that that brings. And also people are, are out there that um, actively disagree um, with not teaching abstinence only education. And so, you know, how do you deal, how do you navigate those incredibly difficult conversations um, and still, you know, like, how, have you received any pushback or any feedback on your, your choice thus far? Um, and what is that, what's that been look like? What does that look like for you? Oh, that's a great question too. Um, so I think I, I definitely, at first people were a little bit scared. I think there's a lot of anxiety around teaching sex to children, which I understand. I mean, it's, it can be a very sensitive topic for a lot of parents. Um, and a lot of parents, I think they're afraid of, oh my God, it's too early to teach our children. And in reality, if your kid has an iPhone, your kid is old enough to learn about sex education or else they're going to get it from other places that might not be educational. Um, so really putting that into perspective and a huge way that I was able to um, avoid pushback was bringing in pediatricians, which I know seems a little bit crazy, but I had pediatricians come in and they basically said, developmentally, kids can handle this. <laughs> like these kids are about to go, if not are already going through puberty in the fourth grade. And it's really important to give them this education in a timely manner and not when you're in high school in 10th grade and you're like, oh, this already happened to me. Why do I even care? We do, we wanna give this information in a way, not to scare our kids, but to prepare them for the inevitable changes that are gonna happen in their bodies. Um, Cause quite frankly, I was not prepared for puberty back in my day. And I wish I would have had someone to really walk me through it. Yeah, you're making me reflect on my own experiences, uh, particularly in middle school and high school with with those with that content. Um, thinking about in Spokane, Washington, where we actually had, I think, well, I don't know. I don't even know how to qualify it in terms of like the, I, we, we talked about sex for sure. We talked about that. Um, and then I remember in, in high school, um, I was part of a program um, that went into as a, as like a senior or a junior, I forget what year, um, we were trained by some group, I forget what group it was, um, but we actually taught as a seniors and juniors, like abstinence only education, and we went into middle schools. And so we always had, you know, the questions that the students had were, um, <laughs> they had they had real significant questions. I'll say, um, and oh, questions yeah. that at that time I was like, I don't I don't even know what that is. You know, like, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, and so we always had to figure out a way to pivot and talk about like the only way that you can't get pregnant 100 percent is through abstinence, right? Like that's what we yeah. always kind of like. That was the language, and and so it's really interesting to see. And obviously, I think I went to a more conservative. Um, uh, high school area than than I did in middle school apparently now that I'm like reflecting on this and so it's really <laughs> interesting and, and again it's something that I don't know how often discussed um, it's definitely not discussed in my circles but that doesn't mean anything um, and so it's interesting and now now I'm also thinking about me as a father and like um, ha already having those conversations with uh, my seven year old son um, and my five year old daughter because you know they're asking questions about body parts they're asking questions about um, how does this happen and, you know like what is, what is that about um, and so trying to be really thoughtful about my responses in a way that, you know, um, is informative and, and, and doesn't create like a sense of shame, um, it, you know, so we can continue to have as, as open as a relationship as we can, um, is, is a really interesting thing. So it's such a, it's such a, a unique, not unique, but it's, it's such a really interesting, um, I haven't thought about this intersection before. And so I appreciate you like jumping into it and, and talking about it. And, and, and I love that it's your passion too. Um, what, dri what drives your passion in this space? Oh my gosh. I think 
I think for me, a huge part of it was really realizing how much different education was coming to Kansas um, and having that experience of get, being able to move to a different place um, for four years was really a huge part of this passion project of mine. Um, but then also when I was at KU, I saw huge disparities when I was a part of the Greek community, um, not only with race, but also with sexual orientation. We had very few um, gay members of the Greek community. And so a few friends and I, we started the Greek allies community, um, which basically was just a space for us to say, we need more representation of every group that is a minority. I mean, I was one of the only Hispanic women in Greek life at KU. Not a huge surprise there, um, but I did, I wanted to see an improvement because if I send my own children to KU, I don't want them to think, oh, this is a white thing. Um, so I think that was really a huge propeller for me to want to improve not only the KU community, but then also coming back home to California and saying, okay, I want to change my own community for the better and then be able to go to other places and hopefully make a positive change there as well. Um, I'm interested also in, in some of the barriers that you faced, um, to get into the doctorate program. Like what are, what, what has been easy? What has been hard about that entire experience thus exactly. far? Yeah. <laughs> right. Thus far. Well, I think the biggest barrier that I had to face was my age. Um, because a lot of people who get doctorates in education are well into their thirties, forties, fifties. Um, so I think they kind of looked at a 24 year old who was really excited about getting a doctorate. Um, and so I think that was the biggest thing. I don't think they saw me being a woman or being a Hispanic woman as being a kind of a barrier to entry, um, as much so as my age, because I am very young for someone getting a doctorate for sure. Um, not that it won't happen. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it, I think yeah. it, I think it will happen. Um, it, it's interesting. And, and age is such a, um, you're right. Cause some people will have the bias that you need more experience in order for you to actually understand and comprehend some of the issues better that are being taught. Um, other people will say like, this is my passion and this is what I love and this is what I want to do. And so like attention there. And it, obviously sometimes it's generational as well. Um, it, it's just, it, it's fascinating. Like, um, I, I love your energy and I love your passion. And so I think it's, it's cool to see this in action. I think it's cool that um, we have folks that are modeling the way for, for younger folks to, to navigate these waters um, and to say that this is a possibility, that this is possible. Um, and we have some advocates in the room. And, and, and you know, um, something that I've been thinking about a lot with the current like events and, and previous events and events prior to the previous events um, is really like, how do we show up um, for our communities that um, may not have their voices represented, um, who are disenfranchised actively by the systems, right, that, that are in place. And so um, it, it is a it is an intersection that I don't think a lot about, but definitely like in the health education and the sex education. Um, I also wonder, um, how many people of color, black and brown folks, um, are in those spaces as well? And I wonder what that does and what those conversations are like and what kind of um, like cultural responsive, uh, what does what cultural responsiveness look like in those conversations? Um, you know, and so it's it's interesting because there's a lot for me to kind of explore and discover. So I'd love to actually, I just love to hear your thoughts as well. Like, um, as you diversify the field, you know, what do you, what are some conversations that you think will change overall because of it, because of the diversification? Sure. I think one of the ones that really needs to be addressed as soon as humanly possible is the disparities that black women face during childbirth, because a lot of people don't realize the more, uh, the mortality rate for black women in America is absolutely ridiculously high. And it's just, I mean, I just still cannot get over the fact that it is just crazy. Um, and a lot of people don't talk about this. Um, and thankfully, I do have the books and the resources available to kind of look more in depth as to why that is. And it really just boils down to systemic racism um, and people get, being able to get away with stuff that they shouldn't be able to get away with. 
Um, but you're right. It's in my uh, in my space. There are not that many black educators, and I think that that really needs to change just for the representation, but also just to be able to um, provide our students with the information that they need to have. Yeah. And yeah, for sure. Adults too. I think that's a huge part of my sex education as well is I don't just teach the kids. I teach the adults some stuff that they've never learned before. Like I did a whole parent discussion on what it means to be transgender mm. because my parents didn't know what that meant until they were there, had her whole documentary. Yeah. And I mean, it, it's just, it wasn't discussed or really brought to the forefront until very recently. Um, so being able to have those conversations, I think is just the most important. Um, do you find that parents are willing to engage in these conversations? Um, how do you deal, uh, for, for two part question, do you sure. find that, um, parents are willing to engage in these conversations? And then two, um, once they're aware of the information, how many, how, this is just a, a the wrong, that's the wrong question, but like, um, how many folks, I guess, choose to remain ignorant of some of these issues after they've mm -hmm. had access to these resources? Um, and, and like, how do you navigate through that? That's a really good one. So I think, I think a lot of my parents that I have been able to interact with have been really positive and they take um, a lot of what I say as fact, which is beautiful because I do, I back it up with a lot of science and I think a huge part of kind of eliminating the ignorance is by purely giving them scientific facts and not, imp I'm not trying to kind of impart any of my morals or ethics on my parents or their children. I'm just there to say, this is what this is. This is what that is. If you would like to go home and teach your children any religious morals or ethical morals, that is your prerogative. I'm not the parent at the end of the day. Um, so I think that's been a huge uh, kind of success point for me is really just um, giving them the facts. And then also before I teach the children, one of the things that I loved doing was sending out parent emails and saying, this is what I'm going over. This is exactly what it means. <laughs> Cause again, I'm, I don't want to assume that the parents know what a lot of this is because quite frankly, they don't. Um, and so educating the parents first, and then they're kind of like the liaison between me and the classroom with their children. So making sure that that education is again, continued at home is really important to kind of eliminating that ignorance that the parents might have. But honestly, I've had a lot of really good positive experiences, um, with this education. That's, that that's great to hear. And, and, you know, I, um, one, I commend you for the work that you're doing. Um, I commend you for the hustle. I commend you for, for, you know, leading the way and, 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 you know, um, I think skillfully having these conversations and your commitment to science, um, and, <laughs> and what that is, um, we are almost, I can't believe it. I've, I've lost track of time. So we have roughly five minutes left. Um, anything that you'd like to kind of share with the audience that we may have not covered here? Oh, over well, the course I, of our conversation. I, I wrote a couple of tips and advice. Cool. Uh, of things that I wish I would have known when I was during my undergraduate time. And I think the biggest one for me is to intern, volunteer, or work as much as humanly possible. Because when I was at KU, I had six different internships, all within the journalism realm, because that's what I majored in. Um, and then again, I volunteered in a classroom and I found what I wanted to do. And all of those experiences were all of those experiences were great because either they showed me I really don't want to do this or I really love this. So really, getting that experience is, I think, the most important thing. Um, and then also, just relationships need to come first when you're teaching. Biggest piece of advice I could give. <laughs> Good reminder for us all. And you, no matter what part of, of of the teaching pathway you're in, you know, if you're at just the very beginning, you're interested and curious. After maybe it's your second career, or third career, um, relationships are key in any industry, in any in any field, but particularly in in the field of education. Um, this has been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time to share uh, with us uh, your experiences and and, and you know. 
Um, and again, leading the way. I, I'm excited to see your future. Um, you are part of the LEC family, so just know that we're here to support you in the long term. Um, so thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Let me know if there's anything else I can do to help. <laughs> awesome. Absolutely. And LEC community, thank you so much for joining us for another edition of Ask an Educator. Um, we look forward to seeing you next week. Have a great rest of your day. Bye.